Now we're going to move down to the town council side of the table. Do you think the town of Plymouth should have a town manager or are you satisfied with the mayor, mayoral slash town council form of government? At this point, I would have to say uh, I am satisfied with a mayor town council form of government. It's been explored several times. I myself, when I was on charter revision, went to a community much like our own, but uh, population-wise and uh, level of income and uh, brought it back to our Charter Revision uh, Commission. However, it never made it on the ballot to be voted on. Uh, the rest of the members on Charter Revision were against it going forward. And it's come up, I think, three times altogether, most recently, uh, not too long ago, and it was voted down by the people. So I'd have to say most people are not in favor of it, so therefore I'm not in favor of it. I would have to agree. I'm not in favor of town manager. I like the fact that uh, every couple of years that the uh, people get a vote for those people that are running their town. I think that's important. I think that letting the people's voices heard is what is what's important. And you know, uh, a new mayor, a new council, if that's what they feel is needed, I think that that's what should be done. So I think having a council with the mayor and the checks and balances that it provides is um, in the best interest of the town. I'm going to agree with Mr. Federovich and Mr. Todd. Uh, the last time it came before the Charter Revision, there was a lot of discussion. You look at the pros and the cons. Uh, a two-year mayor is very accountable to the population. You don't like the job the mayor is doing. we got to stand for election in two years. They have to explain what they've done the past two years. A town manager in some cities and some communities gets a five-year contract, and then it's very difficult to terminate them. Uh, they, ha they have to do something egregious. Or, worse yet, you get a system like they have up in Winstead, which is the worst of all worlds. A board of selectmen, a mayor who chairs, uh, the, 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 it's called the mayor, is actually like the first selectman, and the town manager. And they all fight for power. So it's better to hold one person accountable. Now there are towns, not in Connecticut, but out in the Midwest, where there, there's a town manager and there's no mayor. And then they have um, like a, a board of Burgesses or aldermen. I think our town is small enough that we can find qualified people to run for mayor. And we have enough of the professional staff in terms of the uh, finance, public works, public health, uh, police and fire to support that person. And it, you have to trust the voters. Um, so I think we'll stick with that, and um, as uh, was mentioned, it's already been put on the Charter Revision several times and it failed, so I think the people like our current form of government. What qualities define a successful member of the Town Council? I think first and foremost is honesty, accessibility, and you have to be a good listener. If you don't have those qualities, uh, I don't think you'd make a very good council person. Um, I don't think we should, uh, I'll go into that after, that's another question, sorry, but that's my answer. I agree a lot with a lot of what he said. Um, I think trustworthy is another thing that they really have to have, and I think leadership. I think your town council, they're, they're, they need to be leaders. They need to lead the town. They need to lead with what they do and how they um, how they vote on things and lead the people. And that's what they're that's what they're elected to do. So I think leadership is something that you need to be needs to be a key um, you know uh, characteristic for what they have. Um, I think they need to be a, a, a person of the people. I don't think you can. You know, be a member of council and then hide. I think you have to be accessible. I think you have to be able to be able to be reached, be talked to, because that's you know, that's who you report to. You report to the people. You know, for me, it would be the people in district two. You know, so 
those are the people that you should be held to. So I, th I think that you know they have to trust you. They have to believe that you can lead them, and you have to. And they have to believe that you're honest, because otherwise, um, you're going to have a whole lot of upset people, and it's going to cause a lot of um, tr problems and issues. And that's um, not what the town needs. The town needs to be moving in the in a positive direction. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I think it goes without saying. When you elect people, you put your trust in them, you expect them to have honesty and integrity. Uh, but there's some other skills that are required, especially in a small town like this. You know, we don't really have political ideology. You can't stand on some rigid philosophy and say, no new taxes, state grants are bad, you know, we can't do this. Uh, what you have to do in a small town, I think above all, is be able to exercise good judgment and you have to practice the art of compromise. Look at even those entrenched leaders in Washington have found some common ground and they're actually going to pass a budget this year. Yay, $100,000 a year salaries for our congressmen they figured out they could do their job. Well, for the very small stipend of the, I don't know, 70 or $80 a month that the council pays, you expect us to work together. And that means putting aside petty partisan or personal differences and focusing on what's in the best interest of all the townspeople. That's young and old, rich and poor, uh, you know, whatever side of the tracks you're from. You still have to maintain the roads. We all want to have an adequate uh, education for our, our children. We want to provide for police and fire protection. Uh, we would like to have recreational activities for our children, our senior citizens, uh, and we would all like to do this in a cost-effective manner. Now, that we can have that discussion, and we can disagree on that, and we can disagree on whether or not it's um, you know, uh, ethical or immoral to uh, bond debt into the future that our children are going to have to pay, and that's a good discussion to have. And I think, at the, because I can say this, I'm unaffiliated, so it doesn't matter. I can go either way, whether Republican or Democrat or Independent. It's you, you have to be able to um, reach that middle ground. And ladies and gentlemen, my favorite uh, definition of general consensus is that you can agree to the majority decision, whereas it does not severely compromise your position. It doesn't mean you always get what you want, and it doesn't mean every decision is unanimous. But we strive for general consensus, and we strive to do what's in the best interest of the public. And I learned that my first time on the council in 2005. Thank you. What, what policies would you support that would help to make Plymouth more business friendly? Okay. Uh, it's up. It's up. It's up. Okay. What I would do uh, to make Plymouth more business friendly, and I, I would be open to uh, tax abatements, number one. It's a good way to sometimes draw uh, businesses into the community. I also would. Uh, uh, we have a we have a commission for that to bring businesses into the industrial park. I would be supportive of them. Also, sometimes out there you see articles in the newspaper or on uh, different medias where uh, certain businesses, even some rather large businesses, are thinking of making a move. Well, as a town, sometimes I think we need to go after those people. Because if we don't, other towns and communities will. And they talked earlier about a, you know, a shrinking uh, tax base for businesses, and and that would be one thing that I think would be helpful. Thank you. I can't I can't name any policies that I'm particularly in favor for or against. But what I am in favor of is more businesses. So. <clears throat> Uh, businesses are unique, and I think each business when it comes into town would have unique circumstances and what they need, what would help them benefit. I think we need to look at everything that's available, whether it's a tax break for a business um, or if it's to help them find, find the right land for their business. I think whatever we can do to help them get them here and get them you know, paying taxes in this town, I, I think is a good thing. As Mr. Jobe said earlier, 
this is a 20 percent of our of, of our grant list and that's not that's not good enough that's you know our taxes are way too high because of that so anything that we can do to bring businesses in I think we have to look at whether it's you know the way they've done it in the past or if it's a new idea I think we need to look at everything and do you know and you know look at it compared to what, what we're going to give up as to what we're going to gain from it and in the long run if it's, if it's going to be a gain I think we have to we have to consider those things you know in the short term and in the long term so anything we can do is, is something that I would be open to you know, um, investigate and um, be in favor of. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, my favorite subject. Uh, here's what we have to do. In addition to what these gentlemen have just said, uh, we have to put on a, a favorable and a positive face of the town. If businesses and the, their scouts and their commercial realtors believe that your town bureaucracy is, is uh, anti-business or uh, prohibits uh, rapid approval of permits and licensing, then they will go come here. They'll go somewhere else. Now, one of the things that uh, was done when I was on economic development is we got the phase three of the industrial park. Now, that's a state town joint venture, and the grant money covered the acquisition of the land and the construction of the roads. And we've been slow to fill that industrial park. And because there are rules and regulations that are imposed by the state, certain businesses uh, can't, we can't have, and uh, there's uh, standards for building along Preston Road. We have a lot of land zoned for industrial development. And let's take this uh, New Inland Fuels, for example. How did we get that business? Do you think they just plucked Plymouth out of the phone book? They were looking for a town that had a reasonable tax rate, uh, some skilled, available skilled labor, and key to their business was transportation infrastructure. And we just happened to have a rail spur coming off of that old rail line that runs along South Main Street. So the mayor did the right thing and jumped on this opportunity because that property was sitting fallow. That property was, was worthless, foreclosed, uh, covered with rubble. Uh, we had been stuck with a four or $500,000 delinquent tax bill with Structus, and One we minute. were collecting no money, no revenue on that property. So turning that around into a, a tax-paying, viable industrial site, it has to go case by case. And I will say, the mayor is the salesperson and the council and then all the other boards and commissions have to be receptive. And that doesn't mean we have to accept any kind of business, and that means that uh, we want to make sure that they're going to create good paying jobs. You really don't need low paying minimum wage retail. That's not really going to help boost our grant list. Thank you. Are you for or against changing of the charter from two years to four years for the mayor's position? I am in favor of seeing a charter revision commission take a look at this and to ask questions and to take surveys to find out. Personally, I think it wouldn't be a bad idea. When you check the numbers, a mayor comes in for 24 months. Uh, if he's a new mayor and hasn't been elected before, it might take him a few months to get organized and to get his feet wet, so to speak. And then, the last six months of his term, he's running for re-election. So you have a total of 15 months out of the two years served. The way I look at it, 24 months, less nine months of getting used to the, the ropes and then out there politic. And I'm not saying that the mayor isn't serving his mayor during those times, but his interests are uh, or elsewhere uh, at the time. So four years uh, for at least the mayor, I'm not sure about the council, I think would be probably a good thing. Thank you. I'm going to talk to the people and find out what they want. Um, because for me, I'm torn on this one. As a candidate, I'd like four years. I don't think that two years, there's enough time to get enough done. You, there's lots of time to start things. But to see them through, I don't know that you're going to get to see big projects through in two years. So as a candidate, I'd, love, I'd like to see four years. Now, 
as, a, as a voter, I like two years because if I don't like the job my council is doing, I can vote him out in two years. I like that. So I'm, I'm torn. I, I think if, if it came right down to it and I had to vote tonight, I would probably vote four years just because I think that gives everybody a chance to do some things. Because Mayor Bush is finishing things that Mayor Festa started. And I'm sure Mayor Festa started things or finished things that would start before he got in the office. And that's great. But I would like to have that, them have the opportunity to finish some of the things that they started. Um, so I, I would be in favor of the four years, I think, but, you know, with the way I'm torn, I would, I would, I would want to hear what the people think. If they, if they like two years, I'm okay for that. But, you know, as a candidate, four years. So you don't, we don't do this again in two years. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I think this is going to make for a very interesting discussion because whomever wins as mayor could probably seat a charter revision commission. Now, Here's what I would like to see. If there are enough qualified candidates to run for mayor and to be chief executive, the charter must have a recall provision. Because you can do a lot of damage in four years. <laughs> We're talking about doing damage in two years, but four years, you could really run this town over the rocks. And we don't have a recall provision in the charter. So that if there was someone who got into office and was clearly in over his head or making a, you know, very egregious errors, you'd want the power of the uh, initiative to be able to recall that. Now with that said, I, I'm hoping that maybe Mr. Herring would take that question on you know, in his opening remarks or his question, because we do have um, a full-time mayoral position. It used to be part-time. It used to be that you could run a business or have a job and come into town hall part-time and we've had mayors in the past who were insurance agents and, you know, some, well, some were retired. But um, it is a full-time job. And uh, it takes away from your, your other work commitments and it takes away from your family commitments. So maybe Mr. Herring would want to comment on the four-year proposal. What would, what would your position be on a town ordinance which further prohibits the sale of tobacco-related items to minors? Seeing I used to own a smoke shop, that's got appropriate question. I think right now tobacco sales and the way they are enforced using um, people that look underage going in and I see the different fines going out. That much in the carding and the, I happen to know for a fact that tobacco companies do a good job in training uh, and have resources available for all the convenience stores out there and anywhere else that might sell tobacco products. However, I'm not so sure about e-cigarettes, water pipes, and things like that as it stands now. Uh, I'm not a big person for a lot of town or ordinances, and I, I think the more restrictive we, we make our community, it, it's a little like Big Brother's watching us. But as far as it relates to children and tobacco products, I think that what we have on the books now is sufficient, except with the exception, because they're fairly new, is with e-cigarettes, water pipes, and I think there could be, uh, that had need to be looked into. Not knowing what, uh, what we have on the books, uh, I, I couldn't say whether an ordinance was even necessary or if the state will step in and do something. Thank you. Um, I, I would be I would be in favor of it if it's necessary. I don't know. Um, I don't own a smoke shop or I don't, I don't, I don't work where they sell tobacco. So I don't know if that's a big problem here. I don't know if, if that's an issue that, that you know we have in this town. Um, but if it is, I'd be more than willing to be to, to be open to looking at that and seeing if you know if there is something that we can do that would help. But you know, there again, I, I want to talk to the people that you know own the smoke shops that you know that work at the convenience stores and see if, they, if, if it is an issue for kids coming in and trying to buy, you know, tobacco or tobacco products. If it is, you know, I think, you know, as a town, we need to do everything we can to not only educate the kids about the dangers of the tobacco, but to also, you know, limit them from, you know, getting that until, you know, their legal age to make the decisions for themselves. So, um, you know, I'd, I'd be more than open to looking at what we have and seeing what we actually need. Uh, after the to 
tobacco lawsuit by the federal government a few years back, the statistics show, thankfully, the smoking in the uh, teenage age group is dropping. And, and Jack, I don't know, in, in your age cohort, high school, you probably know the handful of kids who have smoked or are smoking. And as a former smoker, I'm not going to be a hypocrite and tell you, oh, it's bad for you, don't do it. Of course we know that. We've known that since 1964. The problem is nicotine is a very insidious drug. That's why the tobacco companies were sued for spiking the cigarettes with more nicotine to get you addicted. Now with that said, I would like to just reserve the balance. Oh, I don't think we need the ordinance because I think federal and state law pretty much covers that. But let me just reserve a minute of my time to deal with a much more crucial substance abuse problem that we have in this town and in the entire area. 20 years ago, one of the pharmaceutical companies, and I won't name them, told the FDA that their opioid painkillers were non-addicting. This was a flat-out falsehood. They defrauded the federal government and the taxpayers because they got FDA approval, and oxycodone was the worst thing to hit the market for people who had chronic pain problems. Once the government realized how the doctors and the pharmaceutical industries had abused this, it was too late. We have a segment of our population, both from sports injuries, from old age-related injuries, work-related, back problems, that people got hooked on these opioids. And when the government cracked down and the people didn't have treatment or weren't given uh, uh, some type of uh, substitute, they turned percentage of them have turned to illegal heroin. And now we thought that the heroin problem from the 70s and 80s had been solved and it's resurging again. We One minute. Thank you. We can't bury our heads in the sand. This is 10 times worse than, to, than tobacco addiction because it, it, it destroys families, it bankrupts communities. We, uh, it's a, 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 in the inner cities right now, it's spreading through eastern Connecticut, small towns. Uh, people that can't get the prescriptions to the opioids are turning to the heroin dealers. And so we're going to have to work with our law enforcement agencies and we're going to have to get the word out uh, in education programs and offer rehabilitation.